Hello again, and welcome back to another day of daily Bible study. We're going to finish up this week and also finish up this chapter. We're going to start in Acts chapter 18, and we're going to start in verse 24 and go to the end of the chapter. We're going to meet a new person uh, who shows up here and there, uh, named Apollos. Before we do, let's pray. Uh, loving God, we thank you that you have raised up mighty men and women in the gospel, many men, men and women of faith, and, and women and men in leadership. And Lord, uh, none of us are perfect. All of us need further instruction. All of us need to refine what we are about. So Lord, um, as the one who is the giver of all good gifts, of all the skills that we have, that we then nurture, uh, Lord, thank you for bringing people into our lives who can fill in our gaps, who can help us to improve, and in the meantime, can also help to balance us out. Uh, Lord, we need each other. We need the, the ministry of your body as the church. So Lord, help us to be have our place in that and to help us uh, to, to reach out uh, in others, and, and also to, uh, to provide as a united front um, all the gifts that you have given. Lord, be with us, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, we're going to read about a particular person, and I, and I again alluded in the prayer this idea of we have, we're going to see that this person has some gifts, some very strong gifts, and he has some places where he needs to, to be instructed. And I think that's very important that we realize how important that is. So we're going to read that today here. Uh, so, the, so, they, so Paul and his companions have been traveling various places, and they have uh, um, gone on to Antioch. And here we go. This is, and, uh, now, a Jew named Apollos, an Alexandrian by birth, an eloquent man, came to Ephesus, and he was mighty in the scriptures. This man had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in spirit, he was speaking and teaching accurately the things concerning Jesus, being acquainted only with the baptism of John, and began to speak out boldly in the synagogue. But when Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. And when he wanted to go across to Achaia, the brethren encouraged him and wrote to the disciples to welcome him. And when he had arrived, he greatly helped those who had believed through grace. For he powerfully refuted the Jews in public, demonstrating by the scriptures that Jesus was the Christ." So here's this Jewish man named Apollos, who's from Alexandria. This is Alexandria. This is the place where there was you know, the library of Alexandria. I don't remember when the library burned, but I don't believe it's happened yet. I believe that there's still the library of Alexandria, which means that Alexandria really is, in a very big way, you know, the center of learning in the world at the time. So, so you do definitely have, even later, you have a strong um, uh, reputation that if you want to be one of the major leaders theologically, uh, you're, you go to Alexandria. And so you actually had, you had kind of two schools of thought at the time. You had the kind of this academic, you know, I can't remember how they refer to it, but there's this kind of this almost academic view, um, this uh, catechetical school where we're, we're instructing the people. And you also have this Episcopal school where you have, um, you know, the, the leaders and all the rest. And, um, and, and they, so they're kind of two different emphases there. But the point is, so here's this guy, Apollos, who's from this educated capital of the world at the time. And he goes and it says he is, he has several gifts. He is mighty in the scriptures. He's been instructed in the way of the Lord. He is fervent in speaking. This is the kind of guy that Apollos is. And, and we realize he has, he has a gap in his education. He's only heard of the, of the baptism of John. That they were making a distinction here between the baptism of John and the baptism of Jesus. And, and part of that's because we've seen, and I believe it's in Luke, where we are told specifically the baptism of John is a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And what we realize is that Luke is describing the baptism of Jesus as being something more than that. Uh, something more important, that we as Christians don't just go through a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sin. Uh, we have something more significant than that. And we've talked about that, and whenever we've talked about, especially in, I guess we haven't done Matthew yet here, but um, we'll talk about that again. But I'm sure I mentioned it in other stories of the baptism of Jesus, of what does it mean for Jesus to be baptized, and what does that do, and how do we understand baptism in the church today? Um, so he has this gap in his education, and, but he becomes um, a powerful speaker. You know, he becomes an eloquent person who is able to, to winsomely and powerfully uh, debate. Now, I want to be clear about the fact that, again, I, I, when I started as a Christian, um, the, at least people who I knew were very interested in a, in a field called apologetics. You know, this idea of giving an apology, giving an account of the faith. Um, not apologizing for the faith, but giving an account of the faith in a reasonable, orderly way, in a way to help persuade people. And... Um, in doing that, uh, this idea of what people really, you know, the, the great example of someone who could, who could uh, debate with somebody who disagreed with them. And I have very little, um, I'm kind of cool on that idea. The idea of debating doesn't sound very good to me, generally speaking. I think the role for it would be to clear away some bad ideas and some bad arguments and so we can remove some stumbling blocks, but I don't think anybody gets argued into the faith. Uh, if somebody has heard an apologetic argument and then comes to faith, I'll bet you almost anything that God was pretty heavily at work in their life before and that what it was is an argument against it that was giving them stumbling. And when that was cleared away, then the path uh, was unimpeded. 
Um, so, but the point though is here we have another person who is almost being like a second Paul in as much as he has this, this huge education, this huge background, and he's gonna go out and do these things. And, and Paul was specifically known for being a great speaker. And, and remember when we talked about in 1 Corinthians, you had these little factions, um, and that some people were saying, well, I belong to Paul, or I belong to Apollos. This is the Apollos. And um, a guy who has clear and undeniable gifts for ministry. I'm sure that if, if Apollos or someone like Apollos were in our world today, we would snatch him up and say, yeah, we want to make you We want to make you a leader. Whatever leader we can make you to be, we want you to do it. You know, whatever you're willing to do, we want you to do it because you have all these gifts and skills that are valuable for the church. And so I think it's fascinating that uh, we see this activity where Apollos has some of the gifts that are very important and we need to put him in a place where those gifts can be utilized. If we had him serving tables, um, it would be a good thing and maybe it would be good for his humility and it would be good for the kingdom in one way. And yet, because he has these other skills, it, we would also feel partially, I think, that that would be a waste, that he has these skills that he needs to use them for the kingdom. And so here's the thing I want to highlight then for, for anybody who's watching this, because statistically speaking, most people who are watching this are not clergy. Most people who are watching this do not have a seminary education. You know, most people who are, would be watching this are not people who have a full-time vocational ministry. Um, and so it is easy for people to say, well, yeah, of course, Apollos needs to go out and be doing ministry. He's got all these gifts of speaking and intelligence and all the rest. And, and so, but that's not me. Some people might think that about themselves. I'm not always sure that's as true as people think it is. But what I want to highlight the fact is that I, I, one of the things I've, that I've really come to appreciate, and as part of my story as a pastor and as a Christian growing in faith and growing in, in leadership in whatever capacity, is that I had to come to realize that my skill set is very very narrow. And when I say that to people, they some in the church especially, they sometimes look at me funny. And the reason is because the things that I have some skill in are things that the church values. Um, I, I, I can read scripture. You know, I, can, I have a fair understanding of things. I can understand arguments. I can follow lines of thought. I can articulate things fairly well. Um, I can provide perspectives. I can, you know, those kinds of things. Also, on top of that, um, I, I believe that I can preach at least passively well, that um, I can present these in a way that is, to a certain degree, compelling and engaging. Um, I also have gifts with music, which are oftentimes very significant and helpful for the church. And so when I tell people that I have a narrow skill set in the church, uh, people sometimes go, really? Well, and the reason is because it just happens that my skill set overlaps pretty well with the kinds of things that church leaders are, are, are helpful to have. Um, but the thing is, I am not very good at fixing anything. Um, I don't necessarily have a whole lot of experience in kind of just normal, the way the world works things. Um, I have a huge respect for anybody who has any, you know, kind of a ability to, to, uh, um, to build anything, who are able to repair things, who are able to understand how things go together, who are able to design things, who are able to decorate things. These are all things I have zero skill in. And I think it's important to realize that while, yes, it's easy to see the tangible, direct ways in which people like Apollos are helpful. And we do need people like Apollos. We need people who are clear thinkers, who are clear um, students of the scripture, who are clear communicators and all the rest. We need that, absolutely. But it's so vitally important that we are never going to have as many people like that who are going to be able to do the ministry. You know, and, and if you are somebody who has any skills at all in any field, you may not realize how important those are for the kingdom, how important they are for the gospel, how important they are for the church as a whole. And I just want to encourage you in that, and I want to just reiterate a thing that's come up several times this week and over and over again in Acts, and that is when the gospel spread, it was overwhelmingly because the people, the theologically untrained but committed Christians, those are the ones who really made the difference. We needed the educated folks, we needed the folks who had the training to be able to undergird that and give the resources and give the supplies and all the rest, but... Uh, at the end of the day, it is the people who make the difference. And um, so I would encourage you that whoever you are, whatever skills you have, whatever skills you don't think you have, um, realize God's calling you to be part of this difference that he makes in your life, in your community, in your church, and beyond, uh, because you have skills that are needed for the body, and we need to balance each other out. And I tell you what, I may have some skills in some ways, but I need to be balanced out by a lot of other things, and I need other folks to do that because I can only do so much. So I hope that that's encouraging uh, to, to you as we get back in this week of Bible study. But, uh, but that's all for today, and that's all for this week. Come back in next week. We'll continue on with the book of Acts. Have a good day.